Um, on behalf of the planning team, welcome everyone to our third session uh, in the Connecting Together on Seniors Isolation series. We've had some amazing collaborative discussions to date, and we are very excited for today's continued conversation. A couple of housekeeping points before we get started. Um, Number one, as we all are well aware with video conferences, background noises can be very distracting. So please make sure that you are in fact on mute uh, when you are not presenting or asking a question. It will help keep the background noise down. Um, you'll hear more shortly about our presentations today in the theme building capacity. After each presentation, there will be time for question and answer. And again, there's multiple ways that you can do that. So please feel free to use the chat, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, to ask your questions. We also have a hashtag if you are um, tweeting about the conference or using any other social media. Again, you can see our hashtag at the bottom of the welcome screen. Please feel free to use that. And now I would like to welcome Denise Joseph from Indus Community Services, who will be your moderator for today. Denise, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Heidi. So welcome everyone to our series session number three. Um, we could go to the next slide. I'd, I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. So we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work, that we know as Peel, is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land, and by doing so, give our deepest respect to its first inhabitants. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our first panelists. Uh, today we have with us Jennifer D'Amico. We also have Cheryl Hughes, we have Ching Hsiung and Yasmin Rafiq. So their team came together at the beginning of 2021 from the region of Peel to plan a virtual caregiver retreat. Like any good team, it is comprised of different individuals with different backgrounds and skill sets. Great, thank you. So now I'd like to now I'd like to hand it over to Jennifer and the rest of her team. Welcome, ladies. Thank you, Denise. And good afternoon, everybody. I am Jennifer D'Amico, and I am the Acting Community Support Services Manager at Peel. Our community support services at the region of Peel includes the operation of five adult day services and one short stay respite bed in the region. And we're all co-located within five long-term care centers across Peel. We provide caregiver education and supports as part of our services, and it is our pleasure in joining you all today for this discussion on how we can build capacity for caregivers together. Joining me today as co-presenters is Yasmin Rafiq, social worker supporting clients and caregivers across our five adult day services. Ching Sheng, supervisor of the Davis Center Adult Day Service and where we have the short stay respite bed. Cheryl Hughes, our registered nurse providing support to clients across and caregivers across our programs and supporting the team behind the scenes today is Jay Patel, our other registered nurse who also provides support to clients and caregivers across our programs. This team today represents only part of our team of contributors on this project. However, you'll get to know them all as we proceed through the overview of our virtual caregiver retreat and how we came to focus on this topic of building capacity for caregivers. Next slide, please. So now to a little bit about defining caregivers and determining the need. Next slide, please. To further define our caregivers for the purpose of this discussion, we are speaking about unpaid caregivers. The Canadian Institute for Health, CAIHI, information that was reported on August of 2020, reveals that one in three caregivers of individuals who receive, receive home care experience distress. 
our clients and their caregivers sit within this population. Although not all our clients are receiving home care, many are receiving this care while attending our programs, for mm -hmm. instance, and others for reasons um, we know that this population is well uh, documented in our population of clients and caregivers. What we also came to know during the virtual caregiver retreat is that the event content created for this event was transferable, focused on resiliency, self-care, how the pandemic has impacted them and their role as a caregiver, and in supporting caregivers not only of older adults, but also possibly of younger adults and even children. A mother who attended our caregiver retreat is the caregiver a younger child, and she was actively engaged and found the session to be helpful as well as knowing that she wasn't alone. Our promotion for this event included uh, community response table team members, adult day service network providers, as well as our own waitlisted clients and caregivers. We knew that the use of technology would help expand our reach uh, quite a bit farther. Next slide, please. Kaihai also reports that caregivers are are basically twice as likely to be distressed if they care for a person who has communication difficulties or behavior problems. We know that COVID-19 is affecting caregivers as their services continue to dwindle during the pandemic and we all struggled to fill the gaps. We asked ourselves, what could we do to support during this time? What were we going to do? And so we looked for inspiration, but before we proceed, it would be great to know what your experience is in reaching out to caregivers has been like. Next slide, please. So at this time, we'd like to um, implement a poll and we'd like to know in your experience, do you find that caregivers are difficult to reach? For example, do you find that uh, planning events and participation is uh, variable? And the options are yes, no, or sometimes. So I'm looking, Denise, to you. I don't know if um, the poll is up or not, or if you just need a couple of moments behind the scenes. I know we have a backup plan just in case the poll doesn't work, but. Uh, the poll's up. You just need to go on the left, on the right hand side, and you'll see the polling. We do have okay. a number of responses coming in right now. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. My notes were in the way. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> So, yes, uh, I can't see exactly when the poll will be up completely. So I'll need your help when you when you, we've got to that point uh, in your experience. Do you find that caregivers are difficult to reach? You know, do you plan events and then participation is variable? Yes, no, and sometimes. I get to answer too. So I'm not seeing um, if everybody's had a chance to put in a uh, a response. Are you able to see Denise or uh, Heidi? Um, I I just see the response I submitted. Uh, yeah. H Heidi, are you able to see anything different? Uh, no, I believe Sean or Kristen may have the. Yeah, there's a few coming in. We're just uh, some folks still haven't responded to all, but we do have a bunch coming in currently. Right. We're kind of sitting at that 37%, you know, say yes, 3% are saying no, and 40% are saying sometimes. And a few folks um, just have uh, haven't answered yet. But it's looking like that sometimes is taking the lead right now at 41%. Great. Again, 38% for yes and only 3% for no. Okay, interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, I don't know if you're able to put up the poll results for everybody to see or not, um, but I'm sure everybody is kind of interested as well. If not, for some reason, we can uh, make sure we um, come back to that later. For sure. Okay, great. So it is interesting uh, preliminarily uh, based on um, uh, what we've received already that the majority of people are sort of split between the yes and sometimes not so many with the no. So this is very interesting and we'll come back to that a little bit later in our presentation. 
I'd like to now introduce you to Cheryl Hughes. She's our registered nurse who since the onset of the pandemic has been redeployed into long-term care. And then she took on a temporary assignment as program support nurse leading the infection prevention and control measures at Peel Manor. Uh, since that time, she's returned to the adult day service and got into the implementation of the virtual caregiver retreat. Oh, I see there's something coming up just for a moment on the screen. Uh, I'll just continue. She's, uh, Cheryl has been involved in the development of the Caregiver Lunch and Learn since its inception. So I will now hand things over to um, Cheryl. If we are not going to the um, results of the poll, I will ask for the next slide, please. It appears the poll results are visible to the folks now. It is visible, okay. Great, thank you so much for pointing that out. I had my notes in front of that bar. So we've just, before we go to Cheryl, I see it's 27 out of 68, two out of 68, 29 out of 68, and uh, some did not have a chance to answer. So definitely split between the yes and the sometimes. Thank you. And Cheryl, over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure being here today with everybody. Even though it's virtual, it seems to be the new way things are. So, it seems like we're always marking time now as pre-COVID or before COVID, the pandemic, and then one day soon, I hope we are all going to hear the words post-pandemic or at least the road to recovery. Things are starting to look promising for the road to recovery. Our numbers are declining, which is great news. Our caregiver and support journey begins in 2016 when we planned and successfully implemented our first caregiver retreat. It has evolved over time and we came to expect to plan a caregiver lunch and learn, usually planned for May and October each year. In March of 2020, everything changed. Our pandemic response meant we would continue to provide support to caregivers, but with much limited resources and staff as they were redeployed to long-term care, including me. And clients and caregivers are now staying home. We continue to provide counseling, navigating the system and wellness checks with very limited staff and Yasmin as our only social worker. We thank Yasmin very much for all her support. Noticing the increasing needs of our caregivers, we began to think about reaching out. And through the CRT, it was confirmed, confirmed other organizations were identifying a gap in supports for caregivers as services and programs were limited. Next slide, please. We knew we needed to focus in, on collaboration and co-creation to develop an action plan for caregiver education, support and engagement activities in Peel to assist our clients and caregivers manage during this unprecedented time. Our intent was to bring service provider organizations together to explore concrete ways we can collaborate on sharing resources more effectively to better support our caregivers. Historically, it has been difficult to reach caregivers and provide the supports they need. And to be honest, they were usually too busy or too tired being caregivers to utilize support and education we were trying to offer. We will utilize a co-creation model to involve caregivers and form the building blocks of this action plan that will be more beneficial to our caregivers. We will use feedback from caregivers obtained during the virtual caregiver re retreat that we held in May of 2021, and it was a great success. Caregivers are the forefront of this continuing discussion with their input and ideas at the center of our action planning. Being able to strategically and method methodically take action for caregivers to access the support they need now and in the future will be the measure we will work to achieve together. We will always prioritize areas of focus based on caregivers needs and match with community provider resources. 
As a collaborative, we can also work towards addressing gaps, building capacity, and voicing caregiver needs in Peel. Technology and innovation will be key in sharing resources and reaching caregivers, utilizing digital platforms, enhancing digital literacy, and reducing barriers to access supports and resources. Next, I would like to pass it on to Yasmin, and we have the next slide. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Yasmin, the social worker. And as Cheryl said beautifully, our focus was really on the caregivers. And so we knew that our inspiration needed to come from our caregivers, and we would be able to, and they would be able to inform us on what supports education and services they need. So we had them in mind as we reimagined our in-person engagement, which was our caregiver lunch and learn, and developed our first ever virtual caregiver retreat day. And therefore we struck an interprofessional team, which was comprised of our two registered nurses, Jay Patel, as well as Cheryl Hughes, who you just heard from, Ching, um, Ching from the Davis Center, who is our Zoom expert, and our two amazing social work students, I'm a touch bias because they're my students, Jennifer Bolt ice as well as Anastasia Pijek, and our amazing leader, Jennifer D'Amico, and myself. And so we developed this retreat with our ADS caregivers, um, our active and waitlisted caregivers across Peel in mind. So one of the things we did was the social work team reached out to the caregivers who we have been, um, my team has been in touch with them throughout the pandemic. Um, being the social worker, my role is to provide support to both clients as well as caregivers. And so we continue to reach out to them and we found out exactly what they would like to see at our first caregiver retreat day. From the format of the day to virtual platform, that they prefer speakers, activities, and even our giveaways. Next slide, please. Oh, I think we skipped. Oh, there you go. You got it. So some key considerations. Now, I should give you just a touch of background. We had some incredible success with the virtual memorial service, uh, our first ever virtual memorial service that we um, had done, had, um, done in April of 2021, and we had an overwhelming success. We had over over 100 people in attendance, and you know, it really gave us a lot of courage and confidence to push forward and pursue organizing this uh, caregiver retreat day event. So one thing that we did know was that technology was gonna be, it can be a barrier. Therefore, we engaged Tech Coaches, which is an organization that specializes in helping people understand technology, and they happen to have a lot of experience working with the older adult population. So we had them facilitate some pre-events for staff, as well as for caregivers, which was very well received. And um, we also needed to, we also needed to consider an appropriate and very fitting theme of the day. Nothing, we wanted it to be something supportive, uplifting, and engaging. And we came up with a feel good day. I mean, in reality, nowadays, who can, who couldn't use a feel good day? So we felt like that was very fitting and it was just a beautiful way for us to set the, to set us up for a really great day. Uh, we also needed to get some informative and engaging um, speakers. And we had three, we had three speakers, which included a caregiver. Actually, I'm sorry, we had four speakers, actually. We had uh, three PRCs, uh, and one was a former PRC, and we also had a caregiver and a life coach that came to us with lived experience, and she brought a very important perspective of some challenges that she faced due to cultural expectations, which is so important to highlight since the region of Peel is such a diverse, uh, has such a diverse ethnic makeup. We also had um, facilitated four breakout rooms and uh, they were comprised of uh, laughter yoga, Bollywood dancing, mindful meditation, and chair yoga. And lastly, we needed to engage our caregivers to help us drive future caregiver supports, education, and services. 
which we did through polling, question and answers, as well as a, a chat box. Uh, next slide, please. So we got this um, we got this whole day rolling with uh, setting the intention of the day. As I stated, we set it up to be a feel good day with wonderful speakers, activities, and even prizes. And um, so that's uh, and so our incredible Zoom aficionado Ching will now share the results of those polls that we had put forward to our caregivers that day. Uh, next slide for Ching, please. And here you have Ching. Thank you, Yasmin. I hope you can all hear me. Excuse me if I'm a little nervous. Okay. Um, to help us build, we needed to know, uh, to help us build our capacity, we needed to know what our caregivers wanted and needed. We launched a poll during our caregiver retreat. We asked our caregivers, what kind of supports and services do you need? Uh, we gave them such as in-person supports, navigating the system, counseling for families and couples, connecting to other community supports, support with long-term care planning, crisis support, support in identifying caregiver strain, support groups, counseling one-to-one -one or in-person supports. Their caregivers wanted help with all of these choices, but navigating the system, counseling one-to-one -one, and counseling for families and couples were the top picks they chose. This was surprising for us since we never thought of families and couples counseling. Thankfully, Yasmin, our social worker, brought this option up due to her social worker practice experience. We also want to know what future educational sessions they would like, like, uh, for example, advanced care planning, respite care options, power of attorney, using technology and ex access to devices, access to affordable nutritious foods, medication education, downsizing your house, transition services, alternative housing, diabetes education. Again, most of these choices were picked, but respite care options was the number one choice, with advanced care planning and power of attorney also being important to our caregivers' future learning. We had an amazing, diverse response to all these po to all these questions in the polls that opened our eyes to future planning. Ultimately, what we found out about our caregivers at this retreat is they wanted to be pampered. They wanted more self-care, free stuff, and having something done for them. The breakout rooms were greatly enjoyed, and they, they wanted the resources that we had uh, given to them at the retreat, such as the notes given from our, by our speakers to give to them so that they could remember what happened at the, at the retreat. Can you please, uh, next slide please, Sean or whoever? <laughs> Thank you. So we have a whiteboard. I believe this is a jam board. And how would I go about doing this? <laughs> I'm hoping someone will put that in the so chat we, box. Yes, yeah, so we have the link and we'll just put it in the chat for you, okay? Oh, thank you so much. No problem. So everyone, if you could go to your jam board. <laughs> so. so for our attendees, we need your help. Using the whiteboard or the jam board, can you tell us what services, supports, and education do you offer? I hope you can put some uh, ideas on the board. And since I've never used this before, can someone explain how you use a Jamboard? <laughs> just for people who don't know how to use it, you just write? Yes, you just select the sticky note uh, on the left side. And then you can choose to color code it as you wish and type in your note and then submit. Perfect. Thank you for the explanation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Wow. So we have uh, transition, oops, sorry, monthly caregiver education sessions. This is how you support and educate. Uh, financial planning, training for volunteers, local information resources, outreach advocacy, navigating services, connection to organizations with resources, financial planning, webinars, peer support groups. Wow, you guys got great ideas out there. Counseling, caregiver nights, information sharing, game support. Never even thought of that. Wow. 
transitional long-term care beds? Yes. Sharing of links and resources? And I'm not sure, it's OCO reference as they offer scale programs and one-to-one -one counseling. In-home respite care. Connections to telephone reassurance programs. Wow. I hope you're, we're gonna be keeping this board, right? <laughs> Afterwards. <laughs> Perfect. So can I ask another question? We have another question. So can we go to the next board? Or do I flip it? My next question is, what services do the caregivers you serve need in addition to what you are currently offering? What services do the caregivers you serve need in addition to what you are currently offering? And I think that's on number two. That's an, if you go to the top, I learned this one. Yeah, you go to the next question, yeah. So we have financial support for respite, share resources, respite caregiver support groups, overnight respite, reassurance calls, knowledge of dementia, cultural, Culturally and language appropriate services. Strategies to support responsive behaviors. Social engagement, definitely. How to have a difficult conversation. More support groups, directions. Oops, sorry, I lost that one. Okay, sorry. Groups, directions, resources available, navigation, respite, more coordinated case management. Thank you. So I have another question, one more. What are, if go to page three, what are the barriers to providing these additional services? What are you finding as barriers? providing these services. It's page three. Digital literacy, definitely. Long wait lists, trouble finding the caregiver, formal funding and resourcing, language, burnout, caregiver burnout, definitely. Time. Yeah, caregivers do not have the time, definitely. Cultural stigma, cultural dexterity, uh, organizational capacity. Um, messaging to the caregiver, implementation of supports, burnout, burnout funding time, sorry. Lack of access to information, technology, support. Definitely. Transportation, lack of access to information, health system barriers, primary care care providers who have it again. <laughs> wow, lots of barriers. Um, health system, sorry, barriers, primary care providers who have older adult care expertise, coordination of supports. And system navigation, too many organizations. Who is the best to connect with? Yeah, definitely. Child care, yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Seven, 10 years wait list for supportive housing. Parenting. Thank you everyone for your, your input here. Thank you so much. Okay, can we go to um, the next slide, please? So what is the future? What are our next steps? 
How can we help ease the access of our caregivers to various modalities and programs? Primarily during COVID, primarily now during COVID, when in person can't even be provided, uh, what are the platforms we need are needed to support our caregivers? Can we collaborate and help our caregivers connect to programs and services? I say yes, yes we can. By developing a collaborative care ne caregiver network and peel to build capacity, include caregivers as active partners in the caregiver collaborative network. Develop an action plan by September of October of 2021. Develop a matching principle, match services with caregivers through use of technology, collaboration, networking, coordination, etc. Identify gaps in services, education supports, and advocate for funding. Next slide, please. We are here to build capacity. We have a weekly electronic caregiver newsletter we would like to share to help build capacity across Peel. Um, if you like to register, I believe I, I'm hoping you guys, yes, thank you. Jay has put it in the chat box. We hope to share this link in our chat box, which uh, Jay has done. Now let's begin. Next slide, please. To join the Collaborative Caregiver Network in Peel, please contact Yasmin Rafiq and Jennifer D'Amico. We can also utilize the great partnership in the CRT to support collaboration and help build capacity. So thank you very much everyone for all your help today. And Jennifer, I'll leave it to you if there's anything more that needs to be said. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today and uh, helping us to build capacity. Over to you, Denise. <laughs> thank you. Um, again, thank you very much, Jennifer, Yasmin, Cheryl, and Cheng for providing us such insightful information that we can all benefit from using. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome participants to ask the ladies any questions by typing it in the chat box. In the meantime, I will ask uh, a question. Um, can you share one key element that made your initiative successful? I'll jump in just quickly, but team, you can all jump in and add your piece as well. I think really it's about uh, collaboration and um, uh, talking to each other uh, because no one person has all of the ideas or can provide all of the supports. And so collaboration was key um, and uh, to really listen to uh, caregivers in, in their time of uh, extraordinary need and uh, what they would like to see um, in their future. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I see a question uh, popping up here. Do you collaborate with family councils in regional long-term care homes in Peel? I'm kind of looking at Yasmin. She'll have the best answer probably on awesome. this one. Uh, currently, we, we're not connecting with uh, family councils in regional long-term care uh, centers, but I can tell you what we have done is we've promoted our event uh, across our uh, our family of long-term care um, centers in the region to reach out to caregivers because uh, caregivers are caregivers are caregivers. Um, and that's really uh, the emphasis of what, how we want to move forward um, with a collaborative uh, network uh, providing supports to caregivers. So I, I, we can do a lot more. And I think this is the beginning and our springboard to making connections and definitely the long-term care uh, family councils is a great opportunity to help spread the, the word of um, caregivers and the need for caregivers and supporting each other uh, in ways that make sense for um, each caregiver. Great, thank Yasmin, you very did much. Did you want to add anything to that, Yasmin? Sorry. The only thing I would add to that is that um, we do have a wonderful partnership with our social workers in long-term care who uh, work very closely with family council as well as, as well as the resident council. So I do make it a point to share it with them and to have them um, extend it over to family and resident council. But I believe there is a bit more that we can collaborate there on. Absolutely. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. If there are any other questions, uh, just encouraging um, participants to please type it in the chat box and I will be more than happy to share.
Okay, it looks like people are thinking. <laughs> I do have another another question um, uh, just uh, while we wait. Uh, can you offer a piece of advice for anyone planning a similar initiative? Uh, is it okay if I go, Jennifer? So one of the things that we learned from the virtual memorial service that we put on, um, we didn't expect to have over 100 people attend that. And so one wow. thing that we, we learned from it is that um, Jennifer did this really cool thing called like a production list and team. So it was very much so laid out exactly what everyone's role was to be that day. And um, that I can say in the background for those of you who are who do um, who hope to or have done big events, that was incredibly useful and handy. So everyone knew exactly what their role was that day. So there was it, and it's so odd in the virtual world because you can't just say, hey, I'm going to take care of this in person because everyone's on virtually. So it's a little harder to get in touch. So that was, I felt that was very helpful. And in comparison to our memorial service, that was something that was added on and um, uh, something we learned from putting on our first big event. Yeah, thank you. And if I can just add, I think I just wanna give credit um, because we've been doing virtual programs, uh, it's called Boca Distance. And I think you guys talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had some incredible, uh, team members that had experience using Zoom. And that is the platform we used because it was very accessible for our, our uh, caregivers. It's easier to sign on because you don't need to have, uh, you don't have to sign on for the surface of Zoom. It, it is also accessible to different devices and, and, and um, tablets and such. And so the incredible team that they have been used to using PowerPoint presentations, using spotlighting, all those incredible skills that they had uh, achieved through doing virtual programs for our um, clients in the day program came into the forefront when we did this retreat. Um, they were inexplicably, the best part of it is that they were able to run this, um, to show highlight the speakers, show the PowerPoint, come off, spotlight someone else, come on. It was almost like a whole theater production. And I'm sure you people who are in the background, the background doing this right now, realizes how big that is to make the whole um, format run smoothly and flawlessly, to know at what point where you put the polls in, where do you put the PowerPoint presentation in, in the slides, and then emphasizing this person and quieting down the um, background noise so that people can be heard. So I have to give a really big shout out to our ADS team that did that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and are there plans for a second retreat uh, anytime in the near future? Well, we did this debrief after our retreat and we, you know, we learned so much. And I think that, you know, I'll just say the sky's the limit. We can have an in-person, hopefully an in-person retreat, uh, lunch and learns, all those kinds of things again. But we can also learn that um, we can utilize technology to reach more people um, where they are and how they want to receive information and how they want to participate as they can. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. Ching alluded to some of these opportunities in, you know, what's our next steps and what are we what are we going to consider? We can consider um, live stream. We can consider a recording. We can be in person again, hopefully in the fall. And so we will be looking at, um, and I see somebody's put in the chat box about a hybrid event. Yes, I think that's so, uh, that's within our reach now. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, we've had to go through this together and we've learned so much along the way. And we're going to take what we've learned and move into the you know our our new adventures of reopening and being in person again but we've got this new thing uh that we can connect with more people um at times that's um going to be really specific to their needs and i think that is really uh, personally very satisfying but more importantly for the caregivers it's going to mean greater access to supports and services and from time to time hopefully a little bit more pampering too absolutely that's wonderful. Thank you so much, ladies, uh, for joining us today and again, providing us with such insightful information. It's really appreciated. All right, we're going to move on to our next panelists. We have Bonnie Scott, Dr. Kevin Young, 
and Alexis Wise. So Bonnie Scott is the Director of Research and Innovation and Interim Regional Digital Health Lead at Ontario Health Central. She is passionate about using human-centered design to tackle complex problems at the intersection of health, technology, and society. Bonnie is helping facilitate the long-term care planning table in providing solutions to support the long-term care sector during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also have Dr. Kevin Young, who currently works as the Medical Director of Integrated Care at Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care. He is the Physician Lead for Specialized Geriatric Services in North Simcoe, Muskoka, and is the Co-Medical Director of Provincial Geriatric Leadership, Ontario. Dr. Young is committed to creating a healthcare system that functions well to address the needs of vulnerable patients in the community and in institutions. And finally, we have Alexis, who is the Housing for Health Fellow with SE Health. She is passionate about improving the health and well being of older adults and challenging long held stereotypes about this demographic. She leads the Building with Mission project which aims to support healthcare organizations to develop new housing models for older adults. Alexa, Alexis also works to support private developers to build age-friendly projects. Welcome all three of you. Thank you so much, Danish. Um, we're really thrilled to be here today to present some of the work that we're doing at the regional level. Um, I'm not sure if you have our slides, Danish. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. So you can go to the next slide. And since you did such a wonderful job introducing us, we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, as we know, the past year has been so challenging for everyone, especially um, residents in long term care homes, their families and their caregivers. Um, I think the you know presentation that uh, was before just really highlighted the importance of caregivers and the need to bring caregivers together and, and really talk about what happened in the last year and provide that support and, and well-being support. So um, thank you to the previous group for all that wonderful insight and the project that you guys are doing. So for this work, um, it's really it really started at the Ontario Health Regional level within our central region. And I'm not sure uh, if many of you know about the five uh, new regions for a healthcare system, but Peel actually sits within what's now called the Central Region. Um, and Central Region is comprised of Mississauga, Halton, Brampton, Dufferin, all the way up to uh, the Simcoe area and the Muskoka. So we're actually quite a large region. Uh, we cover about uh, 5 million people, which is actually larger than the whole province of Alberta. Um, and so we are quite a large region. And uh, when we are thinking about some of the challenges within long-term care uh, throughout the pandemic, we really wanted to bring a broad group of people together to start looking at the challenges and potential solutions to help and stabilize the long-term care homes. And so when uh, so after the summer, we actually did a bit of a, an engagement where we did surveys and interviews with uh, residents within long term care homes. We talked to family members. We talked to the long term care staff. Um, we actually talked to public health and the hospital teams that were going into long term care homes. Um, and to really get an understanding of what was going on um, at the home level and what kinds of supports were being provided. What we learned was that um, there were two really large areas that there were some challenges in. And one was around staffing and workforce. Um, as you are probably well aware, there were lots of people, um, you know, not wanting to work in the long-term care homes or, or um, being restricted because of testing positive and not being able to go to work. Um, there are lots of just staffing shortages within the homes. And so that was one area that, um, we were looking at addressing. And then the second area was really around what you see here on the screen is around um, social isolation and what has been termed confinement syndrome. So what we learned uh, during the pandemic is that there was a lot of restrictions on um, people who could visit residents in the long-term care homes so that you know they were really feeling isolated. Um, they couldn't see their loved ones, they couldn't see their family members. And so we were trying to look at ways to um, 
look at you know ways that we could actually improve that so that residents didn't feel so isolated. Ontario Health actually looked at bringing a group of 30 people together into um, what we called a long term care planning table. And the individuals that sat on that table were actually the administrators from several homes, people from the associations, so the Family Councils of Ontario, uh, the Ontario Association for Residence Council. We had people from the hospital sector, people from public health, um, and we also had people from the innovation sector uh, who were helping us think through some of the solutions. Next slide, Denise. So although we know that nothing can really place, replace human touch, we really wanted to look at what could digital technology provide um, to help residents feel less isolated and bored, as well as stay connected with their families. So we started to really look at this digital technology piece. And I know the previous group in their presentation, they highlighted digital technology as a key piece to their work as well. Next slide, please. And so with this 30 person table with all these representatives across uh, different sectors, we thought we had the right group to tackle what we call a wicked problem, to come up with some innovative ideas and solutions for helping residents uh, address the social isolation. There are really two parts uh, to this problem as we start to dive into it. And one was really around the urgent need. So we really wanted to address this extreme isolation and how do we actually help residents in the moment to really um, use digital technology to reduce social isolation. But then there was also this future vision that we started to think about if we actually start to help residents now with te technology, what could be that, um, that longer impact uh, with technology in the long-term care homes? And could we actually start to think more broadly, um, not just around social isolation, but using technology to help with their health and, and well-being as well? Next slide. And so uh, we started back in October and uh, through, through October to uh, March, we started de developing a bit of a roadmap for how we wanted to tackle this. So we started out with a survey back in January um, when we wanted to look at a bit of a lay of the land out in the long-term care around digital technology in the homes to understand um, what types of technology did residents have access to, um, how many devices, um, what were some of the big challenges, and did homes actually think that uh, bringing in technology might actually improve social isolation that was being experienced. And so we did that survey, um, but alongside that, we also started building relationships with some uh, companies that we thought might be able to help us out. So we started to connect with Rogers, Bell, Telus, Best Buy, um, and some companies that were starting to develop senior friendly uh, applications like Clara's Companion and Jerry Connect. And then what we did with those connections was we started to develop these small scale studies uh, where we could actually look at uh, some of the products and technology options in long-term care homes, and then use what we were learning to develop a, a menu of options that could be applied across long-term care homes to help residents with their digital connectivity. Next slide. And so I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Kevin, uh, to walk us through where we are today. That's great. That's great. Uh, thanks, Bonnie, for... Uh... Going through that overview, so um, so in order to start to understand you know what the problem was and and where we were at, um, we distributed some surveys to the long term care homes in our region, and uh, we got about thirty nine of them back at the time that we did the analysis, which we were quite pleased about because this was in the middle of uh, one of the waves of the pandemic, and uh, and we were pleased that people took the time to to give us their feedback and some responses. Uh, next slide. So as Bonnie explained already, um, it's a very large region. You can see the map on the left of all of the the previous sort of subregions that are combined together in order to make up central region. Um, there's all different size homes within the region, um, and uh, and you can see that they're relatively equally distributed amongst uh, what used to be the lens before we were combined. Although central has more homes than all of the other ones did. And the other thing is that there was a big uh, mix of sort of uh, for-profit and and uh, not-for-profit homes uh, throughout the 
um, the region. And so we got a good sampling of sort of all the different uh, styles of homes that uh, that are being run. Uh, next slide. And so without going through all of the survey results individually, uh, we've summarized here some of the really key findings uh, that uh, that we found from the survey. So uh, we heard that long-term care residents face significant challenges, and uh, we've divided those up into five categories. So the first is um, that many of them identify that they didn't have an internet connection at all um, or access to internet, which... Uh, um, you know, many find very surprising in this day and age because internet is just uh, something that is ubiquitous and, and everywhere, um, except for it turns out uh, in long-term care homes. Um, where they did have an internet connection, then access to devices was also an issue. And so, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, no good having internet and no device to access it. Um, device setup and applications was an issue. Nobody really knew, you know, which devices were appropriate, which applications were appropriate, how to set them up. How to teach people to use them, what people would actually use or find beneficial. Um, and then even sort of training on how to use the devices and all of the IT support of getting them hooked up and installed and making sure that that there's uh, no malware on them and, and all of the ins and outs that come with running devices uh, was also lacking in the homes. Um, and then lastly, sort of device management and security and uh, um, and as I said, just sort of, you know, that day to day sort of making sure that the device is, uh, is kept up to date and that, uh, um, and that we make sure that we're protecting the residents and not leaving them vulnerable um, by connecting them to this powerful technology, but that we're using it, we're harnessing it for the good, but we're protecting them from all of the bad things that can happen. So next slide. One of the most powerful things through the survey was actually what people told us rather than what they um, ticked off on our on our Likert scales. And uh, um, so one of the homes said they only had eight tablets for 190 residents to share. So most of us would be totally unsatisfied with that in our home or work environment. And so I think about that for a second. Um, internet signal strength was a big issue and often difficult to obtain good internet connections. So again, even where there was internet, they're often very localized to just the working areas of the staff of the home. Um, the majority of the residents didn't even have a phone line, let alone uh, internet, which uh, speaks volumes. Um, and uh, they didn't have devices and applications that residents were able to navigate independently. Um, and they also found that they didn't have enough staffing and resources to sit with residents and show them how to actually use the technology. So even where it did exist, um, then we're not convinced that it was actually being used to its uh, fullest potential. And so there was, uh, you know, some untapped potential there. Uh, next slide. So uh, through all of this, uh, there was also some some very surprising things that we learned and some definite things that we could sort of put into action and to walk you through some of that, then I'm going to introduce uh, Alexis to take over from here. Hi everyone, thanks Kevin. Um, this all got us thinking about what a different future could look like. And so we wanted to set some pretty ambitious goals and we wanted to imagine a really different digital future for people living in long-term care. So we wanted to think about what it would be like if every resident had access to the internet and to a device of their own. Um, allowing residents to have their own device would let them set up that device and personalize it to their specific needs and their interests. Um, and we also imagined a future where all of the people supporting those residents whether it's families and staff are also connected um, to these devices and are supported to use them uh, to support the residents as well. So this is the kind of future that we imagine, but to get there, we need to learn a little bit first. So let me walk you through uh, just quickly what our very first study was. You can go to the next slide, please. We are running several studies at the moment, but I wanna just highlight for you one that we have completed, just to give you a sense of the kind of work that we're doing to better understand what might be possible and to learn a little bit more about technology use by residents in long-term care. The first study we completed over several months um, and was really enabled through a generous donation of 53 Google Nest Hub Max devices. It's that device that you see there. Uh, those devices were preloaded with a one-year subscription to Netflix, to a one-year subscription to YouTube Premium, as well as to Geek Squad, which is a Best Buy uh, support service. So if you needed any help, you could call the Geek Squad. 
We identified five long-term care homes to work really closely with. We gave each of those homes about 10 devices each. And in each home asked for there to be a single tech champion. So one individual on staff who really served as our point of contact and who was responsible for setting up the devices, monitoring their use, um, helping residents to use them. In part, that was because uh, we were in the middle of a pandemic and no one was allowed into the home. But also it was really important to have someone on site uh, really take an interest in these devices and be uh, a mode of communication for us to provide some feedback on what was working and what wasn't. And then I think a key was really that we then structured a six week onboarding and evaluation program. So we met with the tech champions in every home uh, once a week for six weeks as a group. So all the homes, in addition to learning from us and hearing from our team, were able to share their learnings with one another as well. Um, next slide, please. So we want to share with you a few of our learnings, um, some of the things in particular that busted some myths that we had or that we think many people have uh, when they imagine older adults using technology in the long-term care setting. And this is really our, our interactive portion of the, of the presentation. So if you go to the next slide, we're going to use um, a tool called Mentimeter. So if you have a smartphone beside you, if you want to open up another window on your computer and just go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And when you get there, you can enter this code and this will allow you to vote as we go through the presentation. I'll just give people a few minutes. Get on, I'm gonna load mine as well. <laughs> I know most people don't have their videos on, but if you want to put your video on, just give a quick thumbs up once you're on. That way we'll know that a few of you are, are joining us on Venti. Oh, I see some thumbs up. Thank you, thank you, all you thumbs up people. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. I think a bunch of you are on now. So let's go to uh, the first question. And actually, if you go back to the presentation, it'll, or do you want to show Menti or the presentation? Let's maybe pull up the first question. Okay, so the first question is actually asking about who you think experiences isolation in long term care. Is it residents only in long-term care, long care homes experiencing an outbreak, in larger homes, in not-for-profit homes? Uh, of course. So yes, um, I think going in, we were wondering, you know, was this a widespread concern for people? And of course it was. Residents in all types of homes and all sizes of homes and all locations were definitely experiencing increased social isolation. Okay. The second question is really about um, what long-term care residents have access to personally in their own private rooms? Do they have access to a phone line, to a television, to a personal computer, to a tablet, to the internet? I see lots of people voting, wonderful. Votes are coming in. Okay, so most of you are saying none of the above. And actually we have found, we found in our, our baseline research that there was just an incredible amount of disparity and inequity around the type of access people had to all of these things, even to landlines and to television and personal rooms. Definitely not all residents have access to those things in their room. Um, and as Kevin mentioned earlier in the presentation, things like a tablet or Wi-Fi, uh, those were particularly sparse, but we were really surprised to hear that even something like a phone line wasn't standard in every single room. Okay, let's go to the next question. We wanted to better understand who would benefit from using digital technology. Um, what about people who have no cognitive impairment? What about people um, who have end-stage dementia? What if someone's hearing impaired or visually impaired? What if someone has responsive behaviors? We wanted to get a better understanding of if we brought devices into a long-term care setting, who do we think would benefit?
You guys are a great audience. Absolutely. So I think we had um, some ideas that perhaps some residents might benefit more than others. We weren't quite sure. But what we really found was despite a range of different abilities and the different comfort levels with digital technology, a really wide set of residents were able to benefit from having technology. Um, and many of the features that were enabled by this device, but by many others, were particularly helpful for different abilities. So um, some residents really appreciated having louder audio in their, on their device. Some liked to have a picture-based interface. Um, we found great interest in using different language translation type services or having access to different applications and different entertainment in different languages. Um, the range of capabilities was wide, but so were the uses that we found people using the devices for. If we go back to the presentation, I'll walk you through a couple of the other myths that we were busting in our initial study. Uh, I won't quiz you on them. You're a good audience. You can probably guess, but um, a few other things that we learned. So typically in many long-term care homes, there are a set of, of um, devices that are available for residents to share. And um, what we found through our, this initial study was actually that, sorry, if you can, you can flip through the slides to myth number four. So a few slides ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, we found that residents really actually benefited from having their own device rather than sharing a device. Uh, it allowed for residents to have preset preferences on the device, to remember things they'd been to before. Uh, and what this study really showed was that rather than having a device in a common space, if we could have devices uh, assigned to individual residents in their private rooms, that would be of great benefit. And, you know, I think Kevin mentioned this earlier, one of the, one of the pieces of feedback we even got was, you know, could you imagine right now sharing a single smartphone or a single tablet with even your entire family, let alone an entire home? So um, that was a really important takeaway. When devices were in common spaces in the long-term care home, they were typically used for far fewer things. And really in common spaces, mostly these kinds of devices were used for playing music, which was great, but they have such a broader set of capabilities and those weren't really taken advantage of until they were put in private spaces. Uh, the next myth was really about um, the involvement of staff. So we were concerned, if you go to the next slide, um, and we have heard this feedback from others about the burden that having additional technology in the home might place on the long-term care staff. But in fact, in our first study, staff did not feel overburdened by having um, use additional devices in the home. There was additional effort required, especially at the setup stage. But in fact, the devices allowed many individuals or many staff members to engage with the residents in new ways that they hadn't been past and really felt like they sort of added some joy and invigorated the day to day environment in the home. So um, there was a lot more music being played in individual rooms. People were engaged in a different way. And so the, staff, the feedback from staff in particular was really wonderful, and this was not seen to be an additional burden. Um, if you go to the next slide then, one final myth uh, was really just about the use of these devices. So because we were intending to address social isolation, we were wondering how these devices would be used and felt that you know, maybe calling friends and families who lived outside the home would be their primary use, particularly using video calls. But in fact, um, they were used for so many other things. So the most common use of these devices were for playing music in a range of languages and for watching videos content also in a range of languages. Um, the devices that were used for all kinds of different things. They could be used for a fitness class. They could be used the feedback we heard that was fun was, you know, Residents would get together in the morning and start to try and guess what the weather was in all different parts of the world. And so look up, you know, on the weather app, what's the temperature in, in Florida today, in California today. Um, and that was becoming a fun activity for residents um, on a regular basis. So I think our study really showed that residents were enjoying the use of these devices, that they could be used in a really wide variety of ways, um, and that staff found them valuable in the home rather than an additional burden. This is all data. This is all kind of myth busting, which I think is great. But until you hear some stories, uh, I don't think it really comes alive. So I'm going to ask Kevin to walk us through just a few of the residents that we met through our work. Kevin, I'll pass it to you. This is my favorite part of the whole story because uh, this is where it really came alive to me in ways that 
Um, I can't even describe to you because um, what I hoped we would accomplish in the study and what we saw was just a few examples was uh, so much better. Um, so the first uh, the first of these stories is Colin. Um, and Colin was really excited about getting a device. And uh, as soon as he got it, the first thing he wanted to do was um, to have a guitar music uh, put onto the device. And then he pulled out his guitar from the dusty corner of his room um, and started playing along with the music, became emotional. Everybody was just surprised to see how he engaged with it and just this side to him that they didn't even know existed. And it was just overwhelming for the staff to be part of that, just watching him enjoy himself and despite his physical limitations, just to be able to let loose and connect with the music in that way. So um, the the staff uh, in the home, the tech champions described it as sort of a bittersweet moment for him, uh, for them to see him uh, playing his guitar. Um, next slide, please. The next one, which was uh, a real sort of remarkable eye opener for me was uh, Mi Zhang. Um, and so she was a resident that everybody had assumed was nonverbal. She only spoke Korean. She laid in her bed most of the day. She didn't move. Um, and everybody was trying to do what they could to engage her, but it's really turned out not to be possible. Um, and then they got her device and they started playing uh, music and movies for, for her in Korean and like, just what a fantastic idea for, you know, when they didn't even know how much she'd be able to interact with it. And then all of a sudden she started looking more alert and awake and started making sounds. She wanted to get up and go to the dining room for breakfast. Like she just sort of had a whole new life to her. And all of a sudden she could connect with the world around her in a way that made it much more meaningful. So now she uses it every day to check the staff sort of check in and make sure that everything's playing at all the times. And it just gave her a complete uh, new lease on life. So just, um, you know, a really unique way of breaking down some of those cultural barriers and just to remind us, you know, not to give up on people and just assume because they're not interacting that it's because of them. It might be because we're not reaching them in the right ways. Um, next slide. And then the third vignette is uh, John, who is a real social butterfly and uh, loved to connect with his family, but um, hearing was a big problem for him. And they had tried phones and various other devices without success. Um, but when they put in uh, this particular Google device, then it rang for the first time. He actually picked up the call himself. He talked for almost an hour with his daughter. Um, and uh, then he gave them an entire list of people that he wanted to be able to connect with. And uh, so he was able to connect with you know, various family members independently on his own time. You know, when it was convenient to the family, he uh, got to meet his grandchild on one of the calls. And so instead of having to schedule calls that may not be convenient or may not be accessible for all the members of the family, all of a sudden he was able to take control of that and just really, you know, be part of the family and, and interact with the family. And so that was just a real reminder for us, not only um, that technology can help us to overcome some of those sensory deficits, but also that, you know what, there is something really rewarding to being able to control these things and not just be scheduled, uh, you know, when it's convenient for somebody else and just the difference that that can make in, in the quality of those interactions and the number of interactions. So, um, so with that, um, I will, next slide, um, pass it back to Bonnie to uh, talk us through what our next steps are. Thanks, Bonnie. Great, thanks, Kevin. So um, as our next steps, we're going to be continuing our small scale studies. Uh, with a variety of different partners to continue learning and understanding how digital technology can be used in the long-term care homes with residents to improve social isolation. Um, but, you know, we're hoping to wrap that work up by the end of the summer so that we can provide long-term care homes a really practical uh, menu of options that they can start to use to improve digital connectivity for residents. Next slide, please. And so we really want to start to imagine what what are some of those lessons learned that we can start to you know advocate for um, across the system and you know we really were seeing our central region work as something that can be scaled and spread across the province really and so to do that what would actually be needed so we started to give some thought to some of those key ingredients and we think that one of the key ingredients is to really have uh, a provincial or regional support for the evaluation and coordination, um, as well as funding discounted uh, digital technology service packages for long-term care homes. 
And so we really see that there is a role for government to play in this. Um, and we are starting conversations with the Ministry of Long Term Care, as well as other Ontario health regions to see what might be possible as some of this long term care modernization work um, starts to get off the ground in the next couple of months. We really see that uh, we need to connect long term care homes to centralized supports um, to achieve a minimum de to digital technology standard for residents. And, you know, we know that long term care homes there, there's a lot asked of them. And so we don't want to just leave them out there by themselves trying to figure this out. And we really want to create that centralized support for them and to also um, share across the province a set of minimum standards that all the homes can achieve and with the necessary supports to do that. So we know that long-term care homes, though, as a first step, really need to put in place reliable internet network um, that can be accessed by all residents uh, to provide digital devices that are tailored to their individual experience and, and needs um, that can be fully integrated into their daily experience. And, you know, we really see this going beyond social isolation uh, and addressing boredom to something that can really support their health and wellness while they are in long-term care. And then the last but not least, we really see uh, the importance of recreation teams and volunteers and to the previous presentation, uh, caregivers, the real importance of, you know, all these people that really provide that care and support for residents in long-term care to provide um, that enhanced experience around digital technology. Uh, we know there are lots of students looking for volunteer hours, you know, and what a wonderful way to actually have them come into the homes once, uh, you know, it is safe to do so and to, you know, share some of their tech savviness with residents to help them connect uh, to recreation and uh, to other, uh, other people in their community. And we know that to do that, we need to increase the digital literacy training and programming um, across all the people that provide support, um, not only bringing in the volunteers, but also to the staff that are there every day uh, providing care. So we really see these as a, as a set of, um, you know, things that we really need to uh, start to bring uh, or to make it as a reality in long term care to achieve that future vision. Next slide. And so we have a few minutes left and we really wanted to get your thoughts on um, what uh, how how can some of our study findings be applied in settings outside of long term care? So we know that we've really focused on long term care in our presentation, but we know that a lot of our learnings do go beyond long term care to, you know, how do we actually promote aging in the community uh, that's well supported by digital technology? Um, so many of you don't work in the long term care space, but provide other services for seniors. And so we wanted to get your thoughts on um, how the learnings that we shared with you today can be applied in those settings. And so please use the chat box to share some of your thoughts. So I see from Kathleen, she says, I think this would be great learnings for NORCs and to test how something like this would promote the use and access to technology. And Kathleen, I'm not sure if you can take yourself off mute and just explain what NORCs are. Hi, uh, it, nat, NORCs are naturally occurring retirement communities. So um, in some cases, it could be a group of older adults living in a similar building, uh, like Toronto Community Housing. However, it could just be a community that looking at the census data, that there's, there's just a high proportion of older adults within that area. And within that area, what they can potentially do is pool resources. So they may have a community kitchen. They may share resources just to try and help them age in place. Great, thank you, Kathleen. And I see something else from Jen. So personalized devices is a huge benefit that would allow staff to upload programs that are relevant for the individual. Agree, Jen. And it's interesting, there are a lot of benefits, uh, one being just IPAC. Uh, so we can actually be a lot safer in how we uh, use the devices if they are personalized and, and are not shared. Um, so an interesting point that you brought up, Jen. Um, I see something from Shan. Oh, I missed something from Charlene. I work at the adult day program, but currently deployed at long-term care. I am beyond happy that I am extra for Zooms and FaceTimes to connect with families and friends. 
has been a godsend. Yes. <laughs> and Shan, I know that group homes for persons who have intellectual disability have identified lack of technology access uh, have been a major barrier. Agreed. And uh, Kevin, I know you've been quite close to that work. I'm not sure if you want to comment on some of the experience with group homes in North Simcoe area. Yeah, this is a great opportunity where we could sort of cross pollinate um, uh, Waypoint, which is a mental health hospital where I work. Um, in fact, uh, is quite connected with a series of group homes and uh, um, in the region and and sort of more loosely connected with other group homes. And uh, so the ministry that they fall under recently gave a grant for some tablets to be given along with internet connections to those homes. Unfortunately, there weren't a tablet per individual, but we were able to share some of our learnings so that they could set up the tablets in ways that were effective and to start to evaluate them. And we're really looking forward to hearing back from them about what some of their lessons learned are. And we suspect that there's going to be a lot of overlap there. So thanks for identifying that. And uh, definitely, um, you know, like all congregate living settings, I think uh, lots of opportunity here for us to continue to do this kind of work. Thank you, Kevin. Sometimes I wanted to yeah. just, I see Go Jen's ahead. comments about the value of personalized devices. And one of the things, you know, definitely one of the benefits that we learned was the ability to upload particular apps or particular, um, you know, website, bookmark website pages that people go back to over and over again. But the other piece that was really important was um, making sure that the settings aren't adjusted from over time. So um, things like font size, things like volume, um, those were really key in ensuring that individuals were able to become independent users of the device. And when those have to be, you know, aren't set to the particular preferences, I think you start to lose the goal of independence and autonomy. One of the things we were really curious about was how to enhance autonomy with digital devices so that both you reduce um, dependence on staff for support, but also just to provide individuals with that confidence to do things on their own and their ability to do that on their own. And so um, it was really interesting to think about shared devices versus personalized devices. And, and there was quite a difference in what they could enable. But there's a question about the demographic. Um, you know, I don't I don't have the data off the top of my head, Bonnie, about the demographics for the long-term care homes we worked with. We didn't select any long-term care homes particularly on the demographics. So they're sort of representative of the sector as a whole, I would say. Um, Bonnie, do you know anything off the top of your head about the homes that we worked with, if they had anything unusual in terms of demographics? So what we learned actually, it was really interesting. Some homes are very um, ethnic based. Um, so we have a Slovenian home that we're currently working with and um, so they have a particular language uh, need. Um, we also know that some homes are much more diverse just based on where they are geographically in the communities that they serve. Um, so what we learned is some really interesting things around language and how powerful language can be uh, in our early, in our first and continuing studies. And so to the story that Kevin shared around uh, Mi Jun, who really started to perk up and, and engage when she heard Korean, we were hearing similar stories um, with people who were hearing things in their native Spanish language or Italian. And so, you know, the demographic in the long-term care home setting was really critical um, to how the devices were set up and how they were used. And in terms of the programming as well, I think that really speaks to how programming and content on the devices also need to be personalized and customized to the residents' needs, um, especially around language. I see a lot of yeah, interest there, around the yeah. lending yeah, there, programs. There, oh, yes. And if there you are want to of, There are a couple of questions. <laughs> it's okay. There are a couple of questions in the chat box as we're nearing our, our closing. Um, so there was a question, any advice regarding barriers to accessing data? And accessing data in what way? Um, Jennifer, I believe you asked the question. Um, do you want to clarify? Sure, maybe sure. this is not such a, um, a query for long-term care centers where they would have data or internet, but um, if there's any thought about, you know, reaching out to some of these other groups, adult day programs or group homes, um, possibly uh, access to data might be an issue. And I know that 
in the broader community um, when older adults are accessing uh, services virtually uh, data tends to be the the challenge and so you know we've got some workarounds and some ideas but just uh, reaching out to you to see if you have any suggestions right so around data privacy and sharing of information uh, we know that's going to oh go ahead Oh, sorry, but I interpret it more as like data plans. Yeah. Like data yeah. Oh, data plans. Data okay, plans. that's helpful. To be honest yeah. with you, they're both out there, <laughs> both issues, but I was referring to the data plans in a more immediate sort of sense. But the oh. other is the data, which is uh, privacy and access. And I, it sounds like you're doing a lot there too. So both are applicable, but let's just go with the data uh, access. Alexis, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we learned through our work because we were reaching out to the telecom providers was that for some they really do have the older adult demographic on their mind and they have special um, data plans specifically for older adults and so um, that would definitely be worth learning a little bit more and sharing amongst your community with the residents that or the, the older adults that you work with because they had um, sort of affordable data plan options specifically for seniors and I think there were other plans for lower income um, adults as well so there are some specialized plans but affording being able to afford a, a good data plan is a significant challenge and so I think the other way of addressing this a little bit is providing uh, free user wi-fi in public spaces right so the library has obviously a big digital access strategy um, in most communities but uh, other settings could also provide free wi-fi for individuals to um, be able to access internet at those sites right so they can bring their own smartphone or their own tablet but use the wi-fi available at that site right and so i think that's going to be a key part of our um learnings and, and menu of options when that's finalized. So we would love to share it with uh, the uh, organizers of this webinar and share it out with the community so that you guys have access to that. But part of that uh, document we're hoping will be some of those recommendations around uh, is a data plan uh, more sort of cost effective or is improving the wireless of the um, actual uh, site and the organization. Uh, so there's a lot of different options out there around internet infrastructure um, and we're trying to sort of parse out those individual uh, pieces so that we can help help everyone uh, navigate through that. So we'll definitely That's share great. that when it's ready. That's great. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, as we're coming to our 2.30 mark, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Bonnie and her team for coming out today and sharing an abundance of information with us. I'm sure we've learned uh, so much from you today. Um, I'd like to thank all the other panelists as well for, for coming today. And as per our session today on building capacity, all our panelists touched upon key ways they have and continue to connect, collaborate, and develop innovative ideas in efforts to serve and meet the needs of our vulnerable seniors, as well as our caregivers. This ranges from growing awareness and improving access to supports and resources for our caregivers to implementing virtual experiences for long-term care residents. Once again, a big thank you to all of our panelists today. And Heidi, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hi, thank you again. And that was another informative session and just the dialogue that we're all having together is, is outstanding. Uh, we're really looking forward to continuing this um, next week. And uh, I think some of the, the pieces have actually started the conversation today. So it's going to be great to continue to build upon those as we talk a little bit more about technology in the community, as well as diversity in terms of engaging with isolated seniors. So we're really looking forward to next week's session. We hope to see you or, or hear you um, all here at that time. Um, again, uh, Alyssa put a, a link in the uh, chat box, but we will send circulated as well. Please do take a moment to fill out the evaluation for the session. It really does help us in our planning. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and we do hope to see you the next time. And our so a reminder, next week will be our fourth session. And then the, the closing session will take place on June the 28th. So we do hope to um, have you join us again then. Uh, and have a great day, everyone. Again, thank you to all of the planning team and as well as all of our panelists today and all of you for joining us.